It's the My Michelle Live podcast. My Michelle Live Health Watch. She's writing a prescription for hope. Here's Michelle. Thank you for joining me for Health Watch. There was a big news story this last week. Dueling abortion rulings, and it took the abortion kill pill to center stage. Interesting, because since Roe v. Wade, it has become the abortion of choice by 53% of would-be mothers. So this idea of one judge in Texas banning the bill and then another judge in my state of Washington swooping in and making it making it legal in 15 states plus DC it's a mind bender and we're not hearing necessarily hearing no surprise everything in the news so we're going to sort through it as we do on my michelle live we are going to unspin the news find out what's going on find out some of the statistics you didn't know about and in all of it look for the god story and a message of hope and joining me in the quest today is tessa longman she has co-authored some of the most impactful research on abortion and the kill pill Things that I bet you didn't know, but you will after today's program. Tessa, wow. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Lots to cover. Yeah, it is. It's a lot to cover, but that ruling on Good Friday was like, wait, what? So can you walk us through the news story? Yes. So the story starts all the way back in 2000 when the FDA first approved the abortion pill, Mifepristone. And chemical abortion, the abortion pill, is actually a two-pill process. The first pill, Mifepristone, blocks progesterone, and then the second pill, misoprostol, induces cramping and contractions to expel the unborn baby and the rest of the pregnancy tissue. But the, the ruling that just happened a few days ago focuses on Mifepristone because This is the pill that carries the most health risks for the woman. This is the one that is the subject of all of the FDA regulations. But FDA approved this drug for use in the United States using a really politicized process. They rushed it through. They didn't do all of the studies that they would normally do. They didn't even do studies focusing on minors specifically, looking to see how this pill would impact growing girls. Wow. Yes, there's a lot that they just Hmm. didn't research. Tessa, that's really surprising because the idea is a pill just makes things really easy. It's clean. It's simple. You just, you have some cramps, you go to the bathroom, it's over. That's the idea. Thus, it is really pushed on minors because it, you want it to be clean and simple. There's no visit to, quote, medical facility. But what you're saying is they just put this through. There was really, it's not surprising, we lived through a couple of years of something very similar, but they pushed this through without a lot of research because, well, it's popular, it's political, and this is what we want. It just is mind-boggling. However, if it worked the way it was supposed to, then there shouldn't be an issue. But what you have found specifically, this has been an area, one of the areas of your research, and this has been your passion. So we're, we're going right to the person in the know. Tessa, what have you found about the kill pill? So here at Charlotte Lozier Institute, we've published many studies looking at the abortion pill, looking to see how it's impacting women. Of course, every chemical abortion, every time someone uses the abortion pill, that ends the life of an unborn baby, but also it's really putting women at risk as well. Studies have shown that the abortion pill has four times the complication rate of surgical abortion. And in fact, we recently did a study, we looked at Medicaid data from the states that use their own tax dollars to fund abortion for women on Medicaid. And we looked to see how many women were ending up in the emergency room after (laughs) undergoing an abortion. And we found that over the course of the study, which was about 17 years, 
the rate of emergency room visits after chemical abortion uh, for reasons related to the abortion increased by over 500 percent. So this is something that wow. is dangerous and more and more women are ending up in the ER because of it. Do we know why? Do, do, or do we have any idea what's reasons. happening? There are many different reasons that could all be playing into this and I'm sure that they're all a factor. Um, in this particular study, we just see that women did go to the emergency room, but in other studies that we've done, we, some of our scholars and other scholars from the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists published a study really digging into the complication data that's been collected by the FDA. And there are a lot of problems with this data. We know it's incomplete. It's missing the majority of complications. But even with this limited data, we were able to see many women do not go back to the abortion center when they have a complication. They go elsewhere. And we know that mm. over the past couple of decades, the abortion industry has been pushing and pushing against safety protections. They've been using the pill later and later in pregnancy when it get, grows increasingly dangerous, increasingly likely to fail and send women to urgent care or the emergency room for follow-up and it's just been used in more and more irresponsible ways. So it's not surprising, it's sad, but not surprising that we would see this increase in ER visits. Wow, I wanted to make our audience aware of the Charlotte Lozier Institute, which I appreciate because you're science-based. As I know that I come from my viewpoint on abortion based on the preciousness of life, based on a biblical worldview. Now, not everybody comes to it from a biblical worldview. Not everybody adheres to a biblical worldview. That's my thing. But a lot of folks don't. But but arguing on a scientific level, do you remember, wasn't it 2017, this very year on Earth Day, if I recall, April 22nd, so almost exactly six years ago, that there was a march for science. Do you remember that? It was like, I oh, do, you yes. science deniers, we must adhere to science. It was, if you, have you ever been to Seattle? I have not. I've heard it's beautiful. It is beautiful. A little weird. Not as weird as Portland. Uh, but going up Interstate 5, just north of the city proper, on the right-hand side, there is a weird house overlooking the freeway and Lake Washington. And it has big neon a sign that says, science is God. And it has a lot of left-leaning paraphernalia hanging out and aliens by the way no kidding it's a really weird building it's there so I drive by that and I think a lot and they have pro-abortion stuff and LGBTQ stuff and I'm thinking what happened to the sign that said if science is your god how are you ignoring science? And we are. We're ignoring science with where abortion is concerned. We're ignoring science on a lot of fronts and not having a healthy conversation or a healthy debate. That's exactly what we should be doing. And interestingly enough, getting back to the news story that we're taking on today, one federal judge in Texas, Amarillo, Texas, another in Spokane, Washington, these dueling judges, dueling rulings, this pretty much guarantees that this is probably going to go in front of the Supreme Court. What are we looking at in the future? It's still winding its way through the process and the, the government has appealed in both cases, actually. So the judge in Texas gave a seven-day window to allow the government time to appeal, which they have. And so they've asked to overturn his ruling. And then in the Washington case, they have asked, because the Washington judge said no changes to the regulations on the abortion pill. And so they've gone back and asked the judge how they're supposed to, to abide by that in the light of the Texas ruling. So there's going to be many developments, probably a lot of back and forth okay. as the over the next few days. Well, but I'll tell you something funny is one of the arguments from Washington, we'll say that side, is that we already ordered all of this. It's already in place. We might as well use it. Can I just ask if we use that logic with, oh, I don't know, something like 
assault weapons. Oh, we already purchased all of these. We might as well let these shops sell all of these assault weapons. We would have people pulling their hair out and frothing at the mouth at that idea. It's just illogical. Either it's legal or it's not. Either it's safe or it's not. And I would even argue, and I'll get your thoughts on this, Tessa, that we've seen way too much power and way too much dishonesty coming from big pharma. And this issue centers around big pharma. I think that this ruling is important because in in some sense, beyond just abortion, it possibly can be a step at reigning big pharma in. And certainly the abortion industry, the pharmaceutical industry are concerned about this. It's going, they're worried it's going to cut into their bottom line. The two distributors of the abortion pill in the United States are concerned and they are involved in these cases because the abortion pill is big business for them. It brings in a lot of money and it is a more cost-effective method of abortion for the abortion industry, especially with the recent changes that the FDA made even just a couple of years ago during COVID to now allow the abortion pill to go through the mail, be available online. Of course, that's going to keep them, allow them to lower their bottom line, keep their costs down. They don't have to pay for brick and mortar facilities in many cases. And so the fact that this is being challenged really does threaten their bottom line. Because women don't really matter after all, even though you see women groups saying, hey, we want reproductive rights. But what about health rights? What about the right to be healthy? What about the right to be safe? Truly, taking myself out of a pro-life mindset and just talking about it in, in the debate form, wouldn't you want if you have a pill out there and it is the law of the land and it is legal shouldn't it at very least be as safe as possible and shouldn't there be pressure to make sure that if they are putting it out that it is not taking two lives instead of just one exactly and that's why this isn't even a pro-life versus pro-choice issue this is something that we can all agree on that Americans should be able to rely on the FDA, to rely on the FDA to make good decisions, to only approve drugs that are safe. And the fact that this unsafe drug has been on the market for so long is deeply concerning because multiple women have died, thousands of women have suffered complications, And these drugs do carry a high complication rate. Many women experience bleeding or hemorrhage. Many women experience incomplete abortions that are going to send them in for follow-up care. Sometimes they'll need a surgery to complete the abortion. And so this should be something that we could all agree these dangerous drugs should not be available and putting women at risk. And let me just reiterate something that you had said earlier that the abortion pill related emergency room visits has spiked 500%. So what likelihood does that put a woman in if she takes this kill pill that she will be in the, end up in an emergency room? That's exactly right. This has been increasing. And our study found that approximately one in 20 women would wind up in the emergency room. And Mm -hmm. now that it's become available online, there are so many things that cannot be ruled out, complicating factors that could put a woman at risk that aren't going to be screened out if she doesn't have that in-person visit with the abortion provider. She isn't going to get an ultrasound to make sure that she's not too far along in her pregnancy where the drugs won't even work. She's not going to be examined to see if she has an ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. These drugs will not end Mm -hmm. an ectopic pregnancy, and that's a leading cause of maternal mortality. Women who have an ectopic pregnancy outside the uterus that then ruptures and causes massive bleeding. So that is deeply concerning. And then there's also the issue, too, that many women are Rh negative. They have a negative blood type. And if there's that difference between their blood type and their baby's blood type, that could cause problems in future pregnancies that could 
almost generate an allergic reaction in the woman. And so if she's not receiving the screening to give her a shot of Rogan to prevent that from happening, that could cause problems in pregnancies down the road. So there are just so many problems with this that are making it even more dangerous when you take out that in-person visit. Tessa, that sounds like people aren't really getting a true choice, doesn't it? When you say, I'm pro-choice, if you don't have all of the information, if you don't know the dangers and the risks, then you're not really making a choice, are you? Exactly. And <clears throat> another issue with these pills is that they can be used for coerced, pressured, unwanted abortions. Already, even before the FDA started making these increasingly available, we were seeing news stories about women whose abusive boyfriends or abusive partners would try to slip these drugs into their food without their knowledge. The boyfriend wanted an abortion, the girlfriend didn't, and so the boyfriend would try to force that abortion. And now if you're just having a video call or even just filling an online form to order the pills, there's no way of knowing who else is in the room and there's no way of knowing who is ultimately going to get the pills when they're sent through the mail. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunity for abusers and for traffickers is huge now that they have this new tool that they can easily access to try to pressure women into having abortions. Mm -hmm. And so just the number of unwanted abortions is going to increase. And so that's another reason that the judge was so concerned about the FDA and the whole approval process that they followed and told the FDA to suspend it because there's just this opportunity for these drugs to fall into the wrong hands. And I'm concerned that we are making death <clears throat> really easy. There's an effect, <clears throat> excuse me, there's an effect that the callous way that we treat the most vulnerable among us the unborn, there's an effect that that has. If we, there were some studies that were done, and it was a limited study, but I thought it was impactful on men who were imprisoned and the effect that having that encouraging abortion had on them. And some had said, if I was willing to kill my own kid, why would I care about assaulting you? Why would I care about murdering somebody else that I don't even know? When we callously treat the most precious among us, even if you are of some unscientific mindset that says, oh yeah, it's just a clump of, clump of cells. It's not necessarily human. No, you've got a Volkswagen rabbit percolating in your womb. Sure. Could come out as a kangaroo. We know it's human, but let's just say for the sake of argument, you're someone who doesn't believe that. Still, erring on the side of life should be something that we talk about. There has, there's not only the effect that a kill pill has on the physical body but there have been studies have there not tessa that there is an effect on the psyche of women and men who have been involved in an abortion and there is healing that is necessary to your emotions afterwards not just your body yes and that is one of the most heartbreaking aspects of this that there have been so many people who have been deeply harmed by abortion. We did one study here at Lozier Institute and we looked at what women were saying online, what they were sharing about their experiences with chemical abortion. And so many women, it was just a horrible experience for them and they were struggling to wrestle through it. They did not expect how difficult it was going to be, how painful it was, but then also the feelings of regret or the negative emotions that they would experience. And for many women, there was that tension between the initial relief and then the regret and, sad and sadness and grief that would follow. And there have been multiple studies done looking at how abortion contributes and plays into poor mental health outcomes. And in fact, just recently, one of our scholars and I, we published a paper looking at survey results from women who had abortion and just the sheer number of women who had felt pressured into having that abortion. 60% felt high levels of some sort of pressure, circumstantial, interpersonal, to choose abortion. And in particular, those women that had felt pressure from people in their lives reported feeling negative emotions, reported feeling that it interfered with their daily life. 
even years after the abortion. And so there is that that definite damage that it can do to the people that are involved, yeah. both the women and men. <clears throat> and even those who are very pro-abortion will sometimes... It- feel that as well you can't get past it and if you'll allow me for just a moment I just want to speak directly to women and women particularly who have had abortions one person that I'm sure you're well aware of is Elvita King she is head of priest for life and she often talks openly about five abortions that she's had and she said you know what there is healing there is healing that can come afterwards one of the things I hear again and again Again, Tessa, from women who've had abortions and have listened to my show and they've emailed me angry or in pain, whatever it may be, and saying, I feel like you're calling me a murderer. I don't even want to go to church because they call, they talk about abortion and they say it's murder and I've had an abortion. They're calling me a murderer. I just want to let you know, Jesus actually said, if you hate it's someone in your heart, you've already committed murder. So I think we're all guilty to a degree. We've all sinned and fallen short. I want you to know you're not a pariah. You're not someone that needs to be hated or thrown stones at because he who was without sin should throw that first one in there. Ain't nobody like that. So my friend, there is healing and there really is hope, but not if we don't have this conversation. That's why I'm so delighted to have you with me, Tessa because this conversation needs to happen. We need to talk about what we're doing to our own psyche when we're killing off in a mass infanticide a whole nother generation. We have to talk about what that does to us beyond just what it does to murdering an unborn child. If we take care of the affirmed, the elderly, those who have mental health issues, and the unborn, it says something about who we are. I'd like your thoughts on that as we come to the end of the program. Yes, that is so true. And I'm so glad that you brought that up, that there is forgiveness and healing and restoration for anyone who might have had experience with abortion. Maybe you've had one yourself. Maybe your partner did, maybe someone in your family did. I've talked with people whose family members have had abortions and that's something that can be difficult for them to wrestle Mm -hmm. with as well. But there is that healing and that forgiveness that is available, it's freely available. And so many ministries that exist to help people, to help women work through this. And then also if there are women who are facing this decision, who are currently wrestling what to do with an unplanned pregnancy. Maybe it's not the ideal circumstances. Maybe they feel like they can't do it. They're feeling that pressure that so many women do experience. There are resources. There are nearly 3,000 pregnancy centers nationwide that offer free resources and the counseling and support that they offer is invaluable. And so there is that, that support and that acceptance available to help anyone who is wrestling with a difficult situation. And you can email us, yeah, find us at mymichellelive.com, and I will help you find support. This permanent solution to a temporary problem doesn't really solve the problem. And I would encourage you, there are people around you to help you to make the brave decision and the right decision. Um, thank you so much for being part of this program today, Tessa. One final question. How do you think this is going to unfold in coming weeks? I think there are many different ways it could go. My hope would be that this would end up with the abortion pill being permanently removed from the U.S. market, from it being prevented from harming women, harming unborn babies any further. But I think regardless of how it turns out, one of the most important aspects of this has been that it's really opened people's eyes to what this drug is, what it does, and what the dangers are. And there have been recent poll results that have come out that showing that a majority of Americans are not confident in how the FDA has handled this process. A majority of Americans don't think that abortion by mail is safe. And so I hope that this will help to spread people's awareness and let women know that these drugs aren't safe and that th- this could put their health at risk and that there are better options available. And it's exciting. It's been exciting and really 
informative. I've really enjoyed our time together, Tessa. But how exciting it must be for you to watch something that you've been passionate about and you've put your time and effort and worked so hard at come to the center stage, come to light on a national level and start to make a difference with abortion, with the kill pill, with the pharmaceutical industry. The things that you've researched could make a difference on so many levels. That must feel good when you go home at night. It does because that is our goal. That's what we try to do at the Lozier Institute is to have that research to support the rest of the pro-life movement to get the facts out there. And so to see the facts getting out there, to see women being informed, in many cases, we are just taking the experiences of the women themselves, their own voices and trying to promote them and get them before the judge, get them before the American people. And so that is very exciting to me to see those voices being heard and to see the judge listening and women being protected. What a delight to talk with you today. Thank you for making the time. I know that it's making a difference. Thank you for reaching out to my audience. And as you watch, as you listen, or as you read, you can go to the Charlotte Lozer Institute. You'll see it on the screen. We will put a link everywhere that you're listening. There's amazing science-based information that can help you if you really want to make a choice have all the information that's the least you should do so i encourage you to go there thank you very much for being part of the program and god bless you thank you so much for having me on more health watch at mymichellelive.com